In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to God forever. Leprosy is a living death. Because leprosy was so contagious, the leper was cast out of his community, from his family, from his friends. He had no commerce with anyone except other lepers. The church gives us to know that we in our souls are leprous. A soul, all leprous and sinful, being eaten away by the guilt and shame of our transgressions. Like the flesh that is eaten away by the leprosy, this is for the prophets of the Old Testament, the consequence of Israel's idolatry, whom the prophets liken, which the prophets liken to the infidelity of a married woman. But how is that any different from us, the new Israel? If, having been married to the Lord through holy baptism, we go chasing after the passions of lust and greed, like the loose woman chasing after any man but her husband. So leprosy makes visible what idolatry does to the soul. Uniting ourselves to lust and greed, this is the essence of idolatry, as St. Paul tells us. Cuts us off from God and joins us to the lords of the idols. Following the prophet Ezekiel, these lords leave us naked and bare. They stone us and cut us to pieces with their swords. This, of course, is a metaphorical description for how they take away our innocence and the peace and contentment that go with that. Let us not pass this off as religious theory. We feel the spirit, the spiritual leprosy in our soul and the dull ache of uneasiness, guilt, shame, remorse, regret that settle like a heavy stone in our gut when we give ourselves to the lords of greed and lust. We feel it, we see it, it is manifested to us in the loss of our capacity for intimacy, our real friendship. We discover ourselves becoming like dumb beasts. These are all symptoms of the leprosy of our soul. Feeling how our soul is all leprous and sinful, we begin to realize that there is no reason whatsoever no reason at all that the Lord should have mercy on us or even listen to our cry. Who are we that he should pay any attention to us? What have we done that he should, that he should have mercy on us? And this realization can throw the soul into the despair of a hopelessness beyond words. So therefore imagine the joy of the lepers when the Lord, as it says, God himself in the flesh, came into their village, into the darkness of their despair. The eternal light himself shone, and a cry erupts from the depths of their soul. They say, Master Jesus, and this word Master in this particular context is a very beautiful word. It's not like the master that is a schoolmarm or teacher. The word in Greek means somebody who stands over you. Master, Jesus, have mercy on us. This is the cry of the psalmist, is it not? For example, my soul is full of troubles. My life draws near to Sheol. I am reckoned as among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Think of last Sunday's gospel. For you to save yourself is impossible. You cannot save yourself. Like one forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom thou dost remember no more, for they are cut off from thy hand. My eyes grow dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon thee, O Lord. I spread out my hands to thee. And yet this last sentence, every day I call upon thee, O Lord, is that not, is this not the word of hope? 
Can you not see a glimmer of hope in that? And you can hear it in the lepers crying out this morning. Master, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, we call upon thee. We spread out our hands to thee. You are here. And let us note how quickly and readily the Lord answers. And how does he answer? He gives them an obedience. For it is through obedience of the Lord's commandments that, as the psalmist says, we come to be. It's through the, heal, the obedience of the Lord's commandments that we are healed. How many times does the Lord say to those whom he heals, take up your bed and walk. And as they obey, they're able to take up their bed and walk. It is the obedience to the Lord's commandments that we are even raised from the dead. Think of his commandment to Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus obeys, and he comes forth raised from the dead. And so the lepers obey. They set out immediately to look for the priest. And at once, it says, every single one of them is healed and made clean as were every single one of us when we were immersed into the saving waters of the holy font. You touch the leper and you become a leper. The Lord touches the leper and the leper becomes clean. He becomes holy. He becomes a child of God. So how should we understand the one leper who was a Samaritan, who when he saw he was healed and was no longer unclean, Return to worship the Lord Jesus. I believe the psalmist again shows us the meaning. He says, for example, I will praise thee with a harp. Let's say, I will praise thee with my heart. I will praise thee with a harp for thy faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praises to thee with a lyre. Let's say that represents the soul. O Holy One of Israel, my lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to thee. My soul also, which thou hast delivered from Sheol. My tongue will speak of thy righteous help all the day long. And we heard it last night at the matins. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. And you see the vital connection between coming to life and praising God. To live is to love God. To love God is to live. The natural, spontaneous movement of the soul that is truly alive is worship and praise and thanksgiving of God in an ever-bubbling fountain that is ever-flowing, bubbling. The heart cannot praise God enough the heart that is fully alive. And this is why the Samaritan was saved. His heart was in love with God. And it is significant that he was a Samaritan because it tells us that it's not your status, it's not your ethnic background, it's the heart that determines whether or not you belong to God. But in fact, every one of us belong to God because he has healed every one of us through his death on the cross, through his burial in the tomb. He has healed every one of us. But only those come to life in answer to his commandment who obey his commandments. And those who come to life are filled with joy, filled with life, filled with thanksgiving, filled with praise of God. The Samaritan wanted to be with the Lord. He wanted to belong to the Lord and to no one else. This is the mark of those who are the Lord's people. This is the mark of those who are saved. Brothers and sisters, if you can imagine yourself actually receiving this healing love of God, if you can even catch a vision, even if you're imagining it, of what it would be like to become one with him, 
of being clothed in the divine majesty of his glory, I think that you would suddenly become very, very afraid. This is a fearsome thing. And I suggest that it's fearsome because we see in the love of God what our hearts are capable of, the depths that they are capable of. They're capable to receive God himself. But we also see how small and hard and constricted our hearts are. And to subject ourselves to the love of God means necessarily that our hearts will break. And that's why it is so fierce to receive the love of God. And yet can you feel in that little imagination, that little scenario that you're drawing in your mind, perhaps we begin to see why the shepherds were afraid when they heard that first Noel. And yet look at the shepherds and note it's not a debilitating fear. It's fearsome. It shakes you to the very marrow of your bone, bones. But it is not a debilitating fear. It's a fear that makes one to rise up. Yes, in fear and in trembling. But you hasten to rise up in a joy and a desire springing from the depths of one's soul to make haste with the shepherds to go right now, they say. Let us go with haste in the King James. Let's go right now to Bethlehem to see this glory of God that has come to pass. And so the shepherds will very soon be joining this one leper. And with the leper, they will begin crying out to us, with the church. Let us raise our minds on high. And in spirit, let us go to Bethlehem to see the wonder of God, the virgin giving birth to God in the cave. Let us understand who we are setting out to see on that blessed holy night. Let us understand who this Christ is, whose angels and shepherds and all those whom he has cleansed and made whole and raised from death to life are crying out to us to come to Bethlehem to see him, to adore him, to worship him. Let Saint Isaac of Syria tell us. He says, be diligent to enter into the chamber that is within you. This is the closet that the Lord tells us to enter in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. It is the mystery of our heart. It's the mystery of the cave of Bethlehem. It's the mystery of the Lord's tomb. It's the sanctuary of creation. That is, through prayer, work to uncover your deepest, most intimate yearning. There you will discover that you are a beloved of God who loves you and longs for you to love him who first loved you. Then you will desire deep in your soul to rise up and go in spirit to Bethlehem into the cave, the innermost chamber of your heart, following the shepherds, following the leper, following all the people who know the festal shout as the psalmist says. <coughs> who walk in the light of his countenance, who exalt in his name all the day, who extol his righteousness. Enter into the cave as St. John and St. Peter entered into the tomb, the empty tomb of the risen Lord, in order to behold the Master, the Lord God of all, born as a little child, born of the most merciful Virgin Mother, these are of the company of the church. They are the throngs of those whom the all-compassionate Lord has cleansed and raised from death to life. They would lead us into the cave as St. John came into the empty tomb of the risen Lord. May we see as a little child, already prefiguring his holy resurrection, the God who alone our soul longs for and wants to cherish, who by his death has cleansed us of our leprosy, has restored us to our original beauty. This is the Master, the Savior, the Lord of all, to whom all who love the Lord 
for all who want to belong to him and to no one else. It is to him that we all now hasten, that we may satisfy our heart's deepest longing and joy, to fall down before him, to adore him, and to worship him on Christmas night, to worship the only lover of mankind, who has cleansed us of our leprosy, destroyed our death by his death, born as a little child, that we might become children of God, born in the lowliness of a cave, that we by his poverty might become rich in the riches of his love and grace in his most glorious and holy resurrection. May it be so. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Amen. Most holy, faithful, most save us. <laughs>